Thanks, Ruth. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thanks for joining in this session. Uh, so as usual, let me start with a quick update on what's happening on this Azure Singapore user group. If you want to connect with all the organizers or any of our organizers, I put the contact details here and also the details for our Facebook and uh, meetup links. Uh, please feel free to contact us if you have any sessions to present or you would like us to organize any sessions as part of this Azure user group. Uh, so coming from what's happened in the past, we have uh, been running this almost every week now for past uh, two or two and a half months. Uh, so here are some of the sessions which we have conducted uh, recently, the last four ones. These are all available uh, on our YouTube channel. And we also have created a dedicated playlist for all the sessions which were done as part of Azure Singapore. So the link is available here in case you want to go back and uh, watch these sessions if you miss them please feel free to go back and watch them at your leisure. What's coming up next, we have uh, next week, Mayur Tendulkar, who is joining us from India. He'll be talking about how to migrate web applications to Azure. This was one of the requests which came up from one of the earlier session where somebody uh, asked us to organize this session. And uh, it's been quite a long time we had this kind of uh, event organized. So I think it's good that we have Mayur, who was part of Microsoft Singapore until recently. He'll be joining us next week. Uh, the following week, we have uh, a different topic, which is uh, for all the Go developers, how Go developers or Gophers can use Azure. And we have Abhishek Gupta. He also will be joining us from India. And then again, by public demand, we have a follow-up session from John Saville about the private link and Azure private DNS. Uh, we also have many other sessions which are already published on the meetup. So if I remember correctly, we have sessions planned until the first week of uh, November. So do uh, look forward to these upcoming sessions. Apart from these sessions, which we are running as part of the Azure Singapore, we also have a grand event happening next week, Microsoft Ignite. Uh, this is running from 22nd to 24th across all the different time zones. And if you have not yet registered for this, uh, you can go ahead and register. Uh, there will be different sections or different segments as part of this event. And this is one of those marquee event uh, which is uh, done every year. And this year, the good thing is it's happening all uh, virtual. So we all can join these uh, virtual events. And then uh, as part of the yearly global boot camps, we also have the uh, uh, Microsoft 365 developer boot camp happening in the first week of November. And uh, there is also the Global AI Bootcamp, which is happening in the second half of November. So do look forward to joining these events and uh, hope you find them useful in the coming days. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we have all these events or all these sessions recorded and they are available on our YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe to get all the latest updates. Now coming back to today's session, we have uh, Christopher Menu who is joining us from Paris and he is part of Microsoft. He is part of the uh, Cloud Advocate team, and he is uh, looking after the startup uh, and helping them do prototypes and to migrate them onto the actual IoT infrastructure. So he'll be talking about how to start your IoT projects. Uh, so without any further ado, I would like to hand it over to Christoph. Uh, just a few reminders before I hand it over. Uh, this session is being recorded and it's streamed live onto YouTube and Facebook. Uh, please keep yourself on mute when the session is ongoing. If you have any questions, please use the raise hand feature of Teams. You can unmute yourself when the session is done and there is a Q&A going on. And if you find these sessions useful, please help us spread the word using any of these social media handles that might be using. So uh, with that, I would like to hand it over to Christoph. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm I'm pleased to uh, be here today to talk to you about IoT, and more specifically, how uh, you can start your own IoT project. Um, I don't know uh, what are your area of expertise, uh, but IoT project. Uh, most of the time needs to uh, spread across um, different engineering uh, fields uh, to create an IoT and Internet of Things uh, product. You have to do hardware, you have to do software design, uh, you have to do uh, maybe cloud or backend database, and also UI because most of the time our IoT uh, project actually need to have an UI. Uh, somewhere uh, on a phone or on a on a web. Uh, so the idea of, of today's presentation is to uh, give you an overview of the tools 
uh, you can you can use to actually start your IoT projects. Assert that your ID can create some value uh, without having to uh, code uh, almost anything or to design your own motherboard because it's a huge thing to learn uh, if you don't, don't know anything about it. Uh, so I'm Christopher Manu. I'm a senior startup uh, cloud advocate at Microsoft, uh, and I'm uh, focused on IT. Uh, IoT, sorry. Uh, you can join me on on LinkedIn or or Twitter uh, at Simanu. Um, so if you have any questions um, at the end of the presentation, I will dedicate some time for Q and A. Um, and if you have other questions after the, the, the presentation, do not hesitate to uh, to reach out to me. Um, another housekeeping item: um, the slides will be shared at the end of the presentation, on top of obviously the recording uh, of the presentation on uh, on the YouTube um, Microsoft uh, User Group Singapore page. So uh, why um, thinking about IoT project can be, uh, can be interesting right now? Uh, the fact is in one year, we almost doubled the market size uh, worldwide for, uh, for IoT. So there is uh, definitely an opportunity here in terms of business. And IoT can now have a wide range of application. Uh, while it is in its infancy was more oriented to predictive maintenance or to uh, specific use cases, uh, right now we can see IoT in a lot of different areas. Uh, so if you're working on almost any business, maybe there is uh, an IoT opportunity uh, right there. Um, but there are several challenges to actually kickstart an IoT project. Um, obviously, as any hardware or uh, software project, uh, there is uh, challenges to go to a, uh, an ID up to a, a release of, of this product. But IoT projects should also overcome uh, several specific issues. Uh, the first one is uh, security vulnerabilities. Um, we all read from time to time uh, in the newspaper or online, uh, somebody was hacked something in an unpredictable way. Um, like one year and a half ago, uh, some hackers um, actually hijack a casino um, IT system going through a fish tank. It was a connected fish tank uh, with vulnerability. They use that vulnerability to access this fish tank. And from that point, they gain access to whole network. Uh, so there is unpredictable ways to uh, uh, to use uh, the IoT uh, uh, project and security should be top of mind in, in any um, IoT project. Uh, the second issue is, um, as it's in the world, IoT internet of things, um, we really we will really need to connect our uh, physical objects to internet or to some kind of network. Uh, but in the IoT space, and we'll, um, I will uh, talk a little bit more uh, about this specific later in the presentation, uh, you cannot rely on, on the network uh, because maybe you're uh, creating a farm IoT system and, and your IoT object will actually be uh, within a farmland uh, far from any Wi-Fi or any wired internet connection. Uh, so we need to take that into account when we are designing our, our IoT product. Um, there is also a lack of standardization around IoT. There is few protocols that are uh, like we can see everywhere, but um, actually a lot of IoT projects are creating from the scratch and people are using their own protocols and there are no ways to uh, actually communicate between devices without having to write a lot of code. Uh, so it could be an issue, not if you're creating your own, just one IoT uh, project, but if you're part of an organization that wants to create a massive IoT uh, project for real estate management or for uh, devices management, and you will actually deploy, I don't know, 10 or, uh, or 50 different type of devices from different manufacturers, uh, it will be um, difficult to actually get them into the same IoT project, um, the same page, the same dashboard, etc because of this lack of standardization. And the last uh, biggest issue when you leave the prototype phase and you want to go on, on production phase is scalability. Uh, it's something to uh, create your own um, little pet project um, IoT for your house or, or something like that. But it's a different story when you have to actually deploy, I don't know, a million 
of IoT devices in the world and manage them over time. Uh, so it's, it's definitely something that uh, we, a, a range of issues we see only, almost only in the IoT projects. And many more. The other issue uh, we encounter with IoT project, and I and I see this uh, with uh, some of the startups um, I'm helping, is uh, there is a difference between a smart object and an IoT object. So uh, let's spend just a minute to uh, clarify this uh, with this uh, dishwasher uh, example. Um, let's take a classical dishwasher. Um, if you want to make it smart, uh, you will actually um, embed a chip in it, and maybe you will have access to some interesting features uh, like a weekly schedule or an intelligent um, cleaning program, like based on the weight uh, or the amount of um, of, of dish uh, you you place in it. So it's it's not a classical dishwasher with just turn on and turn off button, but but you can make it smart. Uh, in in some way, but it's, it's not an IoT product. Then you have the uh, connected objects. Uh, so it's basically um, a smart object, but we put some um, networking capabilities on top of it. Um, and most of the what we qualify as an IoT object are actually just connected object and not IoT object uh, in my definition of things. Connected uh, objects, like in this case, um, uh, connecting our dishwasher, uh, maybe can allow you to monitor or to interact with this device uh, remotely. Uh, like, for example, uh, you have dishwasher in the basement or in the kitchen, and you're on outside of your house, uh, on the terrace or, or in your bedroom, and, and you have an alert when the dishwasher completes, uh, so you can unload it. Um, it's not an IoT. Uh, it's it's it just we have connected it and we have kind of get a remote display um, or remote actions uh, of the object, but we are we are not creating a huge value uh, by just doing this. Um, and the fact is, um, there is a cost associated to um, go from a classical dishwasher to a connected dishwasher. Uh, but when you're looking at a scale deployment. Most of the time, when you're when you're just doing connected objects, you are not creating sufficient value to overcome the cost of actually deploying the solution. So uh, you need to go a step beyond um, and actually uh, creating an, a truly IoT uh, object. Uh, in this case of this dishwasher, um, what we can do when we connect it. Uh, to the Internet of Things and, and using this um, the capabilities of actually uh, connecting uh, not only your dishwasher to your phone, but to a um, uh, cluster of dishwashers um, and, and to the company that uh, creates it, is uh, A, uh, being able uh, remotely to uh, change the performance of the features of the device itself. Uh, so for example, what one, one of the things we can do is um, uh, creating a specific program, uh, washing program, that is not part of the um, uh, initial creation of this product. But because we gather some data and, and because we can uh, actually modify uh, the underlying uh, functions of the dishwasher remotely, uh, we can provide much more value over time uh, to this connected dishwasher. Um, another thing we can uh, uh, probably create is uh, what I call an, an intelligent scheduler. Uh, so let's say uh, you you load your dishwasher uh, after your dinner, um, and you want to have your um, um, all all of this clean uh, in the morning, but you you really doesn't bother uh, when within the night uh, the dishwasher is actually um, working. Maybe we can create an intelligent scheduler uh, that say uh, launch the program uh, when the electricity is a cheaper or when within my area uh, we have the, the most uh, percentage of, of renewable energy uh, within the electrical grid. Uh, so when you're doing this, you're um, uh, clearly um, adding a lot of value uh, within your IoT objects. So as you can say, as you can see, uh, connecting your object, so basically getting Wi-Fi into any object is not sufficient to, to create value. 
Um, another um, huge part of the value created by IoT objects is from uh, the data. Uh, the way of using IoT to actually collect data and from the data process it and extract uh, interesting insights is also the second way of creating value uh, for uh, for IoT uh, objects. Uh, so these two things, um, modifying, uh, creating a new features within an IoT object and, and providing value to data analysis are the two components that allows you to create value from an IoT project. Uh, so it was just an introduction, uh, so if you want to actually launch an IoT project, uh, maybe you may want to have this in mind uh, to actually do it. Uh, now, uh, let's go into the uh, centerpiece of this presentation, which is a bit more technical and actually how to start uh, your, uh, your IoT project. So uh, we will see a different things uh, tonight. Uh, first, the ingredients of an IoT project how to uh, pick up the hardware to actually uh, create your your um, your object how to uh, create the solution without having to code or to solder anything uh, because maybe you don't know it and and you want to uh, try your ideas uh, without having to invest uh, hours of uh, learning uh, to actually do it and there is um, a lot of solutions for actually uh, prototyping IoT solutions without having to code or, or solder anything. Uh, we will see it uh, through a demo. Uh, and then uh, when you are done your, your, your first MVP, your first prototype, how you can go beyond and actually uh, create a, a more advanced prototype or product. So uh, let's start with the ingredients uh, of an IoT project. First, there is the hardware. Obviously, uh, network is really important. As I said, an Internet of Things uh, project need to be connected to Internet or at least to a, a corporate network and not only to just your phone. There is an embedded software that runs locally. Uh, there is some data that is uh, exchanged and processed either at the edge or, or in the cloud. Uh, there is backend software and uh, sometimes uh, the uh, barrier, uh, sorry, uh, the barrier between the embedded software and the backend software um, can be um, uh, can be very lightweight. Uh, one of the ways to improve an IoT object is to get some data from the object itself and then process it in the cloud and send back the results uh, back to the device. Uh, we see this pattern a lot of in in the IoT projects. Um, most of the IoT project we need some kind of UI, uh, maybe to uh, actually interact with the IoT object or uh, just to some dashboards to actually gather uh, the interesting insights from the data generated uh, from the IoT project. Um, servicing, it's something you need uh, to think about uh, very early, uh, maybe not for your first prototype, uh, but uh, for your first deployment. Let's say you you want to deploy a hundred of devices. Uh, you need a way to update these devices, to push new code uh, to these devices and to uh, maybe remove one of these devices from your network uh, if it's broken or, or something like that. Um, so when I described this, um, I, I said it one or two times uh, the cloud and, and, and the question we I I'm, uh, got a lot is uh, why do I need to use the cloud to create an IoT project? Because if my IoT objects can issue HTTP requests. I can simply uh, code an REST API the way I want and host it whenever I want um, and use it. Uh, so why you you may want to specifically use a cloud uh, for an IoT project? Well, there is several reasons to that. Uh, the first uh, the first thing is to secure uh, your your device. Uh, for example, in Azure uh, we have a service called Azure Sphere. Uh, which is uh, part of a uh, hardware and part of, of uh, software that allows you to uh, actually secure your device, uh, secure the applications running onto this device, and for example, limiting the communication from the device to whitelist endpoints uh, within the cloud. Uh, so when, as a, as a backend developer, for example, uh, when you receive a message from a specific device, uh, you can ensure that it's actually one of your devices and not uh, one of the hacker devices that try to impersonate um, an actual device. Uh, 
so that's that's some of the features uh, that are really really difficult to uh, to do if you're doing uh, everything from scratch. Uh, the second things um, 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 cloud IoT cloud servers can help you with is uh, managing the diversity of both of devices and of communications. Um, as I said before, uh, for example, let's say you want to get some IoT um, uh, within a building, uh, you probably uh, will have a bunch of uh, sensors, uh, maybe a temperature sensors or um, um, uh, human detector, uh, presence uh, detector, and et cetera. Um, so you need to be able to manage all these kind of information because all the devices will be different and will send different data points. Uh, the second thing is communication. Uh, maybe some of these devices uh, will have Wi-Fi and other will have other ways to communicate with you. Uh, we will see that um, in, a, in a minute. So you need to manage diversity and an IoT um, cloud solution can help, help you uh, achieve that. Um, an IoT project is useful only if uh, the information and data that is created from these IoT objects are shared uh, with other business applications, other services, other databases. Uh, so you need a way to integrate um, all this IoT information into the existing uh, IT services. And obviously, we have a lot of uh, IoT integration services uh, within Azure that help you with that. And as I said before, um, uh, managing all the devices, all uh, um, all the firmware update, etc., um, and we have uh, tools for that as well. Oops, sorry, I just went to the end of the presentation. Uh, I'm using a new keyboard uh, because my one has an issue since uh, this morning, and I made a mistake. So let's go back to the presentation. So uh, the first thing you may want to pick up is the hardware. Uh, so uh, let's see a few uh, few things about the hardware you can use uh, to actually create your IoT project. And and when I'm uh, saying this, um, uh, you need to think, uh, you need to have a broad thinking about hardware. Um, and I will uh, give you an example later on where I've just put some electronics on an existing device to try to IoTify it. Uh, so you're not, uh, um, there is multiple ways to actually create an IoT object. And one of them is to take an existing object and, and add on top of that some uh, some electronic and not creating from scratch the entire object. Um, so um, the first question I will have for you is, uh, 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 in your definition, uh, can you say um, what in, in this picture is actually an IoT hardware? What do you qualify um, as an IoT hardware? Uh, so we have Raspberry Pi in, um, in a different uh, form factor, uh, but the one you may know. Uh, we have an uh, HoloLens and holographic uh, headset. Uh, we have the Azure Kinect, uh, which is an uh, augmented reality camera, a phone, a drone, a PC. Um, so, um, Answer for yourself um, uh, which hardware below is actually an IoT hardware. Well, in my definition, uh, they are all IoT devices. Um, be why? Because they are all sending telemetry. They all need to be configured remotely. Uh, they all have a state, uh, like the version of the software you're running on. Uh, are they on or off? Are there uh, turn into a specific mode or not, etc. Uh, and they are all connected. Uh, so when I'm saying this, I'm saying that uh, sometimes you will have a very specific um, IoT devices, uh, but sometimes you can also use uh, uh, things that we don't think about as an IoT um, uh, object um, and actually manage it uh, with an IoT hardware. I will give you an example uh, later on. Uh, so if if we go back to um, uh, to pick up your hardware and, and not pick up an Hololens, uh, there is some criteria um, you need to to act on to actually then look for uh, the specific hardware to create your IoT project. Uh, the first one uh, is this access. Um, do you want to 
have a custom made IoT object. So maybe we have to uh, design a board, uh, pick up your electronic components, etc. Obviously, uh, you need to have uh, some knowledge uh, to actually do it. But we will see in the demo that uh, we can have access today to a wide range of ready to use IoT devices. Uh, so maybe uh, the hardware for your IT project is already existing and you just have to buy it and to integrate it. Uh, so that's one of the cool things uh, of, of today's um, IoT uh, situation is um, a lot of projects uh, can really be done uh, or at least prototype with existing hardware. Uh, the second axis you may want to, uh, to look at is uh, the connectivity. Uh, some IoT devices may have no access to internet at all, um, so they need to uh, basically communicate with a gateway uh, to then uh, get in, uh, send some data to uh, to internet. And some of them can be directly connected to uh, an an internet um, uh, connection. And we need to manage uh, this wide range of uh, of devices connectivity. And uh, last but not least, and I done a mistake again, sorry. And the last access is uh, the power. Uh, and it, it's it's one of the important one um, when you look at it. Um, because a lot of devices, let's say you want to uh, put a temperature uh, sensor in a building. Um, you have different ways to do it, but some of them uh, is to um, use a specific uh, sensor that will work on, a, on a, an embedded battery. Uh, with a lifetime of, uh, let's say, five years. That means that uh, you put a sensor in a room and you don't touch it for the next five years. And, and this thing needs to send you data, I don't know, every uh, 10 minutes. Uh, so if you have this kind of IoT objects, we cannot use Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi will consume so much energy that you, you will need to, to have access to a, a current source uh, much more important than, than a, a small battery. Uh, and obviously, some IoT objects uh, can be uh, plugged in uh, into, into the electricity, and, and that's okay. Uh, so most of the time, uh, when you have some embedded uh, systems, uh, we cannot connect them uh, to a, a continuous power source. Uh, we need to use um, button cells and small batteries. And when we're doing this, often it's... Uh, correlates to the kind of connectivity we have. Uh, yeah. Basically, uh, if we have uh, a lot of power, we can use Wi-Fi. If not, we need to use uh, some specific uh, network systems uh, to get them connected. And they, they come with a huge uh, constraints. So let's talk about the real hardware now. Um, the first thing we can pick up is a, is a microcontroller. Um, and, and for example, in my um, smart uh, dishwasher example, I can definitely use uh, one of the microcontrollers. Uh, they are quite cheap. Uh, uh, so this is the um, uh, so it's 50 cents in euros. I don't know the uh, conversion between uh, euros and, and euro money. You can, you can look at later, but it's, it's quite cheap. Uh, then we have uh, a great product in the market, uh, like the ESP32, uh, which is an um, Arduino-compatible um, integrated circuit. We've come with integrated Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and it's around three euros uh, for only the ship. And then you have uh, development kits uh, that can go up to 10 euros. Uh, so I have one with me uh, here. For example, I can uh, show you the webcam. I don't know if you see my webcam well. Let me check that to you. Yeah. So uh, this is an ESP32 um, on, a, on a board, so it's uh, easy uh, to prototype. For example, here um, I have a temperature and humidity sensor connected to it. Um, and I have a, a wide range uh, Wi-Fi an antenna with it. Uh, so this kit is like eight euros, something like that. So it's very cheap uh, to, to prototype or even to, to, uh, to deploy it in, a, uh, in some cases. And of course, uh, you can have uh, things like uh, Raspberry Pis 
were very easy to uh, to code because you, you can have a Linux or Windows OS in it. Uh, you can almost use uh, any language. Uh, so it's very convenient um, to uh, to use it and it's quite powerful as well. Um, and, and you have different form factors. Uh, people mostly don't you know it. They If you know the Raspberry Pi, you probably know uh, uh, quite good uh, the first one. Uh, but the one here um, at the back end is uh, also Raspberry Pi. It's a compute module, uh, and you can actually design your own board and, and just plug this uh, compute module in it. Uh, so if you are doing industrial IoT, uh, this is something you can uh, you can leverage. Um, so all these hardware are great, but you actually need to uh, buy it. And uh, apart from your Raspberry Pi, uh, you probably don't have it um, uh, right now. And the second issue with them is um, actually uh, you will need um, uh, other things um, on top of this. Uh, like for example, uh, let's say you want uh, you have a garden and you want to monitor the temperature and humidity within your garden or within your house. Uh, these components are not self sufficient. So you will need to uh, buy uh, temperature and humidity sensors and to solder things, etc. Uh, so it's a great hardware, quite cheap, uh, but you need a bit of work um, on top of that. Uh, there is other way to actually uh, kickstart your IoT project with off-the-shelf hardware. Uh, the first one, and and it's my preferred one, almost uh, all IoT project I start, uh, I, I try to use this. Uh, this is an Amic chip, uh, so it's um, also an Arduino compatible board. Um, I have uh, one here. Um, it's also have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, uh, which is cool in terms of connectivity. Uh, one of the cool things of uh, this Amic chip is uh, yeah. it's got, as you can see, a screen and two buttons, uh, so you can actually display things, uh, messages, etc. And also at the bottom of the, of the board, uh, you can see them here. Uh, there is a bunch of sensors already built in. Um, like um, humidity, temperature, pressure, um, gyroscope, etc. There is also a microphone and, um, and a headset uh, plug. Uh, so there is a ton of things uh, you can do with, uh, with this device and it's quite cheap. Um, and you can extend it, um, as you can see on the bottom of the device, uh, you, can, you can plug uh, board and get extensions uh, on top of that. So it's, um, it's a, a less cheaper than um, uh, buying an Arduino or, or, uh, um, or an ASP32, but you get a lot of different things embedded. And if you don't want to solder anything, that's a, that's a good choice. Uh, my second uh, uh, choice is the M5 stack uh, series of, uh, of devices. Uh, and the M5 stack is uh, also an ESP32 uh, device. I have one uh, just here. And one of the cool uh, things about the uh, M5 stack is uh, they created this system of stacks. So actually you can plug uh, other components to augment the features of the device. And at the end, uh, you don't have, uh, you have a, like a nice box um, and not the uh, integrated circuit. Uh, display. So if you want to prototype things uh, with a better look, uh, the M5 stack is uh, highly recommended. And they also have uh, small ones now, uh, like this one is an Atom uh, with an uh, LED um, um, matrix. Uh, and as you can see with my thumb, it's, it's a very, very small, uh, very small device. And last but not least, um, your phone. Um, I'm, I'm used to be a mobile developer um, and I have a bunch of phones uh, sitting in my uh, closet. And, and from time to time, I'm actually using my phone to, uh, to, uh, to prototype IoT uh, project because you have a great screen, obviously great connectivity, a lot of sensors um, embedded uh, within uh, most of the phones and it's easy to develop. Uh, so it's, uh, it could be a great choice if you have an older phone to actually prototype your ID, uh, test your UI, and then go on the M5 stack or the Amic chip uh, to get a cheaper uh, way of, of creating your IoT project. Uh, so basically what I'm using uh, when I'm creating um, an IoT project is um, I'm, prototyping, I'm prototyping the first thing uh, with a phone an old phone, then I'm going to uh, using the M5 stack or the Amic chip 
uh, to uh, to be the much more advanced prototype and a much more closer to a final product in terms of hardware components, um, uh, MVP. And then uh, if I have some budget and I want to, to really pursue this product, I will design my own circuits and, and pick up the components, etc. cetera. Um, but you can do uh, step one and step two. Uh, almost everybody can do, uh, can do step one and step two with uh, very few knowledge. Uh, if you want to learn more about how I've um, augmented an, an existing object uh, with uh, with IoT, I encourage you to uh, check out the video with the link uh, below where I show you how I've uh, took an air compressor and, and get it smart and connected uh, with the uh, m chip um, device. Um, Next stage is uh, how to actually create your IoT solution without having to code or solder. Uh, so we saw in uh, picking the right hardware uh, that you can actually uh, do things without soldering. Uh, the, uh, the M5 stack is a, is a great sample of this. Uh, something I didn't show you uh, is, uh, for example, in this Atom device, um, you have groove, um, a groove cable, and, and this groove cable can actually connect to a wide range of sensors. And for example, here is an RFID uh, reader. Uh, so if I just want to add RFID to this small device, I just have to take a cable, plug it, and boom, uh, nothing to solder. And I have added uh, features uh, to my to my info stack. So that's one part of solving things without soldering. But uh, if you want to have a dashboard with all the data display and maybe a map of all your devices, etc., usually you have to code. Uh, so we'll see ways uh, to uh, to do it uh, without coding. Um, and in Azure, we have a product um, targeted to this, which is Azure IoT Central. Uh, and basically, Azure IoT Central is a, a SaaS application uh, to help you manage uh, your IoT devices and create IoT solutions without having to code, uh, or at least without having to code the backend. Uh, if you're creating your own device uh, from scratch, uh, you can connect it. Uh, to uh, to an existing Azure IoT central application. Uh, so uh, without Ferrado, um, let's see how we can create our um, IoT project in uh, in less than 15 minutes. So I will switch to uh, my browser, um, and I'm here on um, azureitcentral.com. I'm already logged in uh, within the application, um, and I will go on the build icon and, and create a custom app. Um, I've, I've picked up the custom app because I wanted to show you how to uh, to create things from scratch. Uh, but as you can see below, we've already created a, a pre-made application uh, for different use cases, different businesses um, already pre-made. And also if you're working for a company or for an integrator, uh, you can uh, also uh, create your own um, templates and reuse that template across different deployments or across different customers. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and, and create a new application and demo Boot Singapore. Um, as you can see, I've uh, picked a custom template, but here I can use all the templates. And then I will uh, go ahead and, and pick up pricing. Uh, so I will just um, uh, pick up startup one for here. Um, one of the interesting things of the pricing around Azure IT Central is it's a fixed price per device. Um, and actually, uh, when you're uh, creating a huge IoT solution with um, IoT connectivity and management, uh, security, and uh, data analytics, etc., it's very, very difficult to predict the cost of the whole solution uh, because you it's difficult to um, to get, I don't know, the number of uh, messages that you will store in the data lake every day, how you will have to process uh, this data and how much time and resources a big data cluster will be need to actually process this data, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's also a great way to kickstart an IoT project uh, when you have um, budget constraints uh, because you know uh, if you know the number of devices, you know the price of the solution. Uh, so that's very easy, and then you can move forward and and, and maybe uh, graduate in a way and create a full-blown IoT solution. 
uh, then I would need to uh, pick up a directory and a, an Azure uh, solution and a location for Azure IoT Central. I'm based in Paris, so I will go ahead and, and, and select Europe. So then Azure uh, IoT Central will uh, provision my application. Uh, my application, obviously, I, I will be able to share it uh, to uh, other team members, uh, and I will also be able to customize it uh, in, in different ways. Um, so one of the things um, I want to do first is to uh, connect some devices. And for example, you can uh, download a specific firmware for the MX chip uh, and connect the MX chip directly to uh, uh, to Azure IoT Central. Uh, so here, um, I can go ahead and click new device uh, to register a new device into my application. Uh, but the, you see that the first thing I've been asked, uh, asked is uh, the template type. Um, so basically, the template type is uh, a definition of what the device is capable of. So um, Azure IoT Central know how to communicate with this device um, and to uh, present a new UI. Uh, specific for this device. Uh, so actually, I need to first not create a device, but create a template uh, for all my devices. Uh, so I will go here on the, on the app settings and, and, and create a new device template. And then I can uh, create a custom device template and create it from scratch. So for example, if you're programming your own embedded code or you're creating your own IoT uh, object, you will probably have to pick up uh, this custom device template. But as you can see, we can scroll in this window. And actually, if we scroll, you will be able to see a wide range of existing device you can just buy and, and connect uh, to, uh, to Azure IoT Central. And this is another way for, uh, for a lot of um, IoT projects uh, you can um, just use one of the uh, templates, uh, one of the existing devices. For example, um, I told you about uh, the real estate um, IoT system where you want to measure temperature and occupancy of a room. Then we have uh, here in, in the catalog an existing temperature and humidity sensor and also an occupancy sensor. So we can just buy a couple of them uh, and connect them to Azure IoT Central and maybe test on one floor uh, our IoT project and see if it's interesting uh, before uh, building more devices, et cetera. And you will have uh, no code at all uh, to, uh, to write to actually uh, create the full uh, IoT system by using these devices. Uh, but what I will do here for the demo is I will go to the end and select the MXship um, IoT DevKit. Uh, next review, yes, and uh, it will create my device template. And when I've done this, um, here I can inspect all the information about this kind of devices, like about this template. So as you can see, I can do things on screens, I can do things with sensors, uh, I have some properties, and also I have some views, I will uh, show you them uh, in, a, in a minute. So now I can go back to devices, and add a new device. Here, now I can select my MX chip and I can uh, type a device name. Uh, simulated. Um, and here, what I will do is I will simulate this device. Uh, it's It takes like five minutes to uh, to flash the MX chip and to connect it to, uh, to Azure IoT Central, so I will not do it here right now. Um, I have recorded the demo uh, earlier, and I will uh, give you the link uh, at, at the end of my presentation. So we can create, and it's also one of the cool things of Azure IoT Central is you can actually simulate a device without having uh, to, to have it physically. Uh, so let's say uh, you find two devices in the catalog that um, um, suits your needs. You can order them, and while you're waiting for them to be shipped, uh, you can actually start to uh, create your Azure IoT Central app. So if I go to uh, to simulated one, uh, within a few minutes, uh, this dashboard will be um, updated uh, with, the, um, uh, with the data. So I just have to wait a few minutes uh, for the simulator to, to start, and then I can get some data. Uh, but one of the cool things of Azure IoT Central uh, is you can actually get data 
uh, from IoT object, but you can also send information to the IoT object. And for example, here uh, within this um, um, device template, we've added a bunch of commands uh, to uh, blink the LEDs, turn off the LEDs, uh, and show a countdown uh, into the device screen. Uh, so it's it's really something um, interesting because you can actually interact with the IoT device uh, from uh, from here. Um, so it's it's a quick introduction. We will wait a few minutes uh, so that I will uh, come and I will uh, show you some other interesting features of um, Azure IoT Central. Uh, one of the cool things we have here is uh, rule systems. Uh, so we can target specific devices uh, like the MX chip. Um, and you can say uh, check uh, every 10 minutes and if the temperatures uh, average is greater than, let's say, uh, 30 degrees Celsius, then do something about it. Uh, so you can actually not only get um, like the dashboard uh, with the data, you can actually uh, take actions when something is happening uh, in the real world um, that is picked up by your IoT object. And in actions, you can do a lot of different things. Uh, email, webhook, so with this, you can do pretty much what you want. Uh, but we also have direct integration with um, Azure Monitor uh, if you want to monitor uh, something more on the IT side of things. Uh, and this is a business rule or something like that. Uh, you can kickstart a port to make our logic app workflow. Uh, and from there, you can, um, I don't know, update the database uh, within another system, uh, add a message to an uh, SAP customer, do whatever you want. Uh, so um, it's one of the cool things of Azure IoT Central is allows you to uh, create application IoT uh, solution that uh, spans not only on the IoT side of things, but can also integrate into all the other IoT services, uh, IT services you have within your organization. Uh, I told you about the uh, service side of things. So the fact that uh, maybe you need to, I don't know, update hundreds of devices at the same time. This capability um, can be done within Azure IoT Central with the jobs features. So again, with the job feature, uh, you can uh, type a name, update uh, firmware to uh, select target uh, devices like this one. And then you can um, uh, specify your job type so you can um, modify your property uh, of, of the object or send a command. Uh, and for example, here I can say uh, turn off all uh, my MX chip devices. Uh, and then you can review it. And when you click run, uh, the fact that um, uh, iterating through all your devices and sending the command to all your devices, uh, this job will, will be done by Azure IoT Central and not by you. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something very interesting. Uh, to wrap up this demo, um, I wanted to uh, show you two other things. Uh, the first one is uh, the data export. Uh, so all the data um, that is sent from IoT object to Azure uh, IoT Central can be exported in real time uh, to, um, uh, to several destinations. Uh, so you are not logged in uh, when you're using Azure IoT Central. Uh, the second thing I wanted to show you is, uh, I'll tell you about, is there is an API for all ID mode. Uh, so uh, you can actually write some code to uh, ease the process of, for example, creating hundreds of devices while still benefiting from all the features uh, I show you within, uh, within Azure uh, uh, IoT Central. Uh, I just wanted to see if we have some data now. Yes, uh, we're starting to have some uh, simulated data uh, for more devices. Uh, if you want to learn more about this and actually want to try out um, how to do um, um, IoT solution with Azure IoT Central. Uh, we have a, a, a learning pass, an entire learning pass on uh, on Microsoft Learn. Uh, I have the link uh, in in the slide, so go go check out uh, if you want to uh, to do it on your own. Uh, what I've what I've shown you today. Um, also, if you want to not read something but watch something um i've uh, recorded a demo um in uh, last july uh, with a french mvp uh, about what is azure IoT central how to use it how to create a device how to connect a real mx chip onto uh, uh, an iot central application uh, so if you have uh, one hour to spare uh, you can you can check out this video uh, on my youtube channel 
So I show you uh, how we can have uh, already available hardware to kickstart your IoT project and how with Azure IoT Central, you don't have to code anything to actually uh, connect these objects and, and get real-time dashboard and data analytics and take actions over the data and send commands to this IoT object. But maybe you want to go beyond. Uh, maybe some of you are developers and you want to actually code something. Uh, so definitely what I show you could be a first step, uh, but you can go beyond that first step. Uh, so if you want to code for devices uh, and, and stay within the Microsoft tools you know, uh, there's a lot of things uh, available for you. Uh, the first thing is uh, we have a bunch of extensions uh, for uh, Visual Studio Code, uh, and, and we have specifically Azure IoT and Arduino extensions that allows you to uh, create your code uh, for your IoT devices, to deploy it to your IoT devices, and also to manage um, IoT devices directly within um, uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, as you can see here, let me uh, display my pointer. Here, um, I have added the Azure IoT Hub uh, extensions. Uh, so Azure IoT Hub uh, is an underlying component of Azure IoT Central, but you can you can use it um, without Azure IoT Central. That basically allows you to manage and to communicate uh, with your IoT devices. Uh, so if you want to build an IoT solution from scratch, you will probably use IoT Hub uh, if you want to build uh, all the UI and all the, the backend services. Uh, and you can actually uh, manage all the devices uh, directly from, from Azure IoT Hub. Uh, the other way of creating IoT projects, because uh, maybe you're not, will not be able to, or you don't want to create an Arduino project, uh, but maybe just having some um, software running on a, a Raspberry Pi. Uh, if you're using Visual Studio, uh, we have a bunch of uh, feature uh, in it, uh, like a, a Raspberry Pi templates, uh, C++ project, uh, Linux remote debugging, uh, so you'll be able to run your code on a real Raspberry Pi device while debugging it uh, from a Visual Studio on your PC. Uh, so there's a ton of, uh, ton of uh, features uh, within Visual Studio to, uh, to do embedded development as well. Um, it could be complicated to uh, set up an entire uh, um, development environment from scratch when you're working with uh, board um, dev kits. Uh, and, and because there is a ton of tools to actually uh, get to be able to compile and to deploy and to create an image uh, from all your different devices. And if you're using, like me, uh, different kind of boards uh, of embedded um, um, controllers, etc. It it could be a nightmare. Uh, but one of my colleagues, uh, Benjamin Cabe, uh, which is also based in France, uh, just released a video uh, about how to use GitHub Code Spaces. So it's basically having your entire development environment in the cloud, uh, but doing it for embedded development, um, and how you can code in the cloud and still debug and deploy code to your real device. Uh, so uh, if you want to experiment that, uh, go check out his, uh, his video. Uh, if you're already a .NET developer, uh, there is a few things for you uh, in this area. Uh, the first one is uh, we have an entire uh, namespace uh, for uh, accessing um, device hardware, uh, namely the GPIOs. Uh, you can use them, uh, for example, on Raspberry Pi and some other um, devices. Uh, and there is also a project, it's an open source project. Um, I've tried it a bit and, and it's quite cool. It allows you to um, develop for uh, microcontrollers uh, like the ESP32 while still using C Sharp. Uh, so uh, if you don't want to learn C++ or Python, because it's the two biggest languages uh, we see in the MD space, uh, then maybe you can try out this project uh, for, uh, for your first IoT project. Um, as I said, one of the issues we have is managing the connectivity. I already uh, told you a bit about IoT Hub. Uh, IoT Hub allows you to um, communicate with your devices by using open protocols. And this is really important in the IoT space uh, because we uh, maybe you want to connect with an existing IoT device uh, but is, uh, has not been created for Azure specifically. Uh, and most of the time you can do it because most of the IoT devices 
either use HTTP uh, to communicate or uh, one of these two uh, open protocols, um, IMQP and MQTT. Uh, it works with a very wide range of devices, including PC, tablets, phones. Uh, so uh, what I've done in, in my air uh, compressor examples uh, is uh, basically uh, prototyping with my phone using MQTT and then prototyping with the MXHEP, uh, with the MXHEP board, uh, still using MQTT. Uh, that way, I'm, I've been able to swap uh, my um, physical IoT device uh, without having to do any code change on the backend uh, because I was just in my backend uh, communicating with IoT Hub and it's uh, the IoT Hub responsibility to take care of uh, office. Uh, and it integrates with your app. We have SDK for IoT Hub for a wide range of uh, languages, uh, including mobile apps, um, .NET, Java, Node.js, Python, uh, C, etc. Uh, then you will have to handle data. As I said before, handling data uh, is um, it's an important component of the value of IoT. And we have some specific products uh, people uh, rarely know. Uh, the first one is Azure SQL Edge, uh, which is a lightweight version of, of SQL servers that can run at the edge on uh, ARM processors. Uh, so for example, you can, uh, you can actually run uh, an Azure SQL Edge database on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so that's great because you can have a bunch of devices communicating with your Raspberry Pi and storing data locally and just sending like alerts uh, to the cloud and not the full uh, data to, uh, to the cloud. Um, and you can also run uh, streaming and analytics um, uh, workflow uh, workloads uh, at the edge. So if you already heard about Azure Stream Analytics, uh, you can run part of the Stream Analytics jobs directly at the edge uh, with Azure SQL Edge. Um, and obviously, we have tools to help you uh, deploy that. So uh, if you're about to have, I don't know, thousands of um, uh, devices uh, with one of them having uh, its own Azure SQL Edge deployments, we have ways to uh, uh, to manage all the SQL servers uh, scattered across uh, across the organization. And and looking at integrating with business apps, um, as I said, uh, Azure. Um, uh, IoT Central's uh, allows you to uh, export data to storage accounts and to send messages to all the applications, a uh, business application with uh, service bus or event hubs, and also uh, integrate with uh, with Logic Apps is also something you can do directly with uh, Azure IoT Hub. Uh, so if, you, if you're creating your your own solution, uh, you can also leverage IoT Hub uh, and, and these connectors uh, within IoT Hub. Uh, so I I hope you learned a few things today, and and maybe uh, some of your uh, IoT IDs uh, are now ready to be tested. Um, my point is, uh, right now everyone can can start uh, an IoT project because you don't have to code and you don't have to solder anything, uh, and I think it's a it's a it's a great uh, time. Uh, to to live in and to be able to get an ID and to actually uh, kickstart small IoT project uh, just with um, ready um, available uh, components. Um, and yes, you will need some ideas, but uh, if you start looking at it, uh, I'm I'm pretty sure you can all have uh, some some uh, IoT ideas. Uh, if you want to try by yourself uh, the product I mentioned today, I encourage you to check out Microsoft Learn, uh, which is an online uh, free uh, learning platform. Uh, so you can uh, do all the exercises online, etc., in a step-by-step -step way. Uh, I've, I've give you two links. The first one is specific to IoT Central. The other one is um, uh, for all IoT uh, Microsoft Learn modules, um, and also a specific modules that um, allows you to test the specific scenario of the MXHIP with Azure IoT Central. And uh, thanks for uh, listening. Um, you can already uh, get the slides on aka.ms slash quiz slides. And now uh, we have uh, time for a QA. and a um, so don't hesitate to raise your hand uh, in Teams so I can I can see it. I don't see the chat window, so I don't know if there is any question in the chat window. 
Uh, yes, Christopher, we do have some questions in the chat window. So let me start with the first one. Uh, this one is from Ranjit. Uh, he is asking, suppose if the device hardware sits in a remote and harsh environment like oil and ring, uh, oil rig or wind turbine farm, connecting to cloud always is not a viable option. In that scenario, how can we establish connectivity, collect data and do visualization? Yeah, but that's a good question. I, I I said a few things about it in the presentation, saying that actually sometimes you cannot have an internet connectivity. Uh, so how you're doing this? Uh, there is uh, different ways of doing it. Uh, so if you're in an oil ring in the middle of the sea, obviously it's a worst case scenario. Um, the, the option you will have here, uh, which is very um, no connectivity environment, uh, is uh, maybe to use Azure um, IoT Edge and then, for example, uh, SQL Edge. Uh, so you can get all your um, sensors on the oil ring to send back data to a central location within the oil ring and then having a disconnected way uh, to send this data back to, uh, to Azure. Uh, so it's a bit of work, but uh, we have some services in Azure. Uh, and we will release uh, some products uh, in the future, like um, Azure servers. You can actually host rugged, ruggedized servers. You can you can buy from Microsoft. Uh, we will have this coming in, um, in in the next months. So that that would be an option. Most of the time, uh, we are in the land, maybe with almost no connectivity, but with some connectivity. Uh, and and if it's the case, uh, you have Basically, you have two to three options. Uh, the first one is to use um, uh, specific IoT 4G networks. Um, the well-known here is called NB IoT. Uh, and actually, uh, I have uh, one of the uh, one of my uh, M5 stack as an uh, uh, and an MB IoT uh, uh, um is uh, quite cheaper than um, uh, buying, I don't know, an, a DSL connection or something like that. You can buy uh, SIM cards, IoT SIM cards for something like one euro per month per device. Uh, and if you're sending uh, very little data, it could be uh, it could be okay. Uh, if you don't have this, um, or you don't, uh, you're um, in an area with no uh, 4G coverage. Um, maybe you can um, you can look at uh, some IoT specific networks. Uh, there is two of them. Um, the first one is a, a private company uh, based in France, but actually with a network all over the globe, uh, which is the Sigfox. Uh, so Sigfox is a, an IoT dedicated uh, wireless network uh, with a wide range, uh, and and you can use that network as well on, on specific devices and with a low power. Uh, consumption, and there is a more open equivalent uh, version of his network, uh, which is uh, name. Uh, I forgot the name. Uh, Laura, L uh, L O R A, uh, Laura Laura One, uh, and and one of the cool things of Laura is you can actually deploy your own network. So let's say you have a huge factory, uh, and one of there is internet in one part of the factory, but the factory is uh, square kilometers, a huge number of square kilometers. You can deploy your own LoRa network to connect all your devices to the central location. Uh, so there is a way to, uh, there is multiple ways to do uh, to do this um, depending on your uh, network situation. Okay. Uh, the next one is, I'm not sure whether it's a question or a statement, but uh, let me uh, put it across. This one is from Iraqi. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, apologies if I'm not saying it in the right way. The question or the suggestion here is, biggest problem with IoT sensor is the power consumption. If you do not have power feed, I use Raspberry Pi Zero as a motion detector in a remote location and sending taken frames via 4G modem. I found out that I need to equip it with uh, 2000 or 20,000 mAh power brick and hook up to 1.5 square meter solar panel to make it work reliably without power feed. And after adding these prices, instead of $10 or 10 to $20 Pi Zero cost, 
whole stuff ended up costing 300 and commercial solutions optimized for power are more expensive so i'm not very sure is it a question or what is uh, the point here yeah but, but the point is is um uh, is is totally valid um when you don't have any power source things are complicated um and and solar panels are are, are a great way to do it uh but you definitely need a lot of components. So it's it's it really depends on um, on what you're doing and uh, your capability of um, integrating yourself your own components. Uh, for example, um, Raspberry Pi Zero is a great product, but if I have to um, design an IoT product that would be deployed at a thousand of locations uh, with low power, I would definitely not. Uh, use that product because we have better uh, microcontrollers uh, for um, consu power consumption wise uh, that we could use. Uh, but they are very specific microcontrollers. You need to really get into uh, microcontroller development. Um, but there is a wide range of uh, low power devices uh, you can you can use. And 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 we have some IoT devices connected to a. Uh, uh, lower one uh, networks, for example, uh, that that works over uh, um, a button cell. Uh, so it's like a, the the battery you have in your watch uh, that can last for two uh, two years, uh, sending several telemetry events per uh, per hour. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of if you have a poor constrained environments, uh, definitely it's much more complicated to. Uh, uh, to get an IoT product, and you have to think about everything, uh, including the rate of uh, data collection and and data sending. Uh, how do you update your um, um, device code? Because maybe uh, updating your device code uh, will burn uh, the poor and, and network allowance for a week, uh, something like that. Uh, so it's it's very constrained environments and. The other uh, part about the ratio between the microcontroller or the Raspberry Pi costing ten dollars uh, up to three hundred dollars with the solar panel and the solar um, um, power conversion system, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, is probably you have just by one solar panel and one Raspberry Pi, etc. Um, there is um, huge. If you're doing one IoT device, it will cost you a lot. But if you're producing thousands. Uh, of of the same IoT devices, then you can negotiate the rates uh, because you are producing a, um, a much bigger batch uh, of things. So that's also something um, um, when you are creating a real IoT project from A to Z. Yeah, is your first prototype will cost you a lot of money, and when you will go to a, a, a production scale deployment, you can lower your cost uh, that way as well. Okay. Uh, the last one is from Nias. He says, I don't think prototype boards are good for industrial or commercial stuff. So coding and design is indeed needed to bring out your product. Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, first, as I said in, um, in my introduction, IoT can span a wide range of applications. Uh, so definitely if you're working on specific environments, if you have specific uh, regulatory um, or compliance um, rules, etc., uh, you may end up in a uh, in a specific case that um, gives you no other choice but build everything from scratch. Uh, I know some industrial components um, and industrial devices, and it's like devices that got millions, than runs on a Raspberry Pi. Like a default Raspberry Pi uh, device, you can you can buy online. They use the exact same hardware. Uh, they just created a, a case for it uh, and plug it into their own system, uh, and it works. Uh, it may be not the best way, uh, and from time to time they have to replace Raspberry Pi. Uh, but even if uh, in a ten-year time span uh, window of uh, this device usage, they replace two or three times the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the total cost is lower than designing their own boards, etc. Uh, 
Yes, I will probably not uh, create an industrial project and put it into production by using Visa Makeship. Uh, but what I like with this is uh, they it's cheapest. It's one of the cheapest way to actually test your ID. Uh, and, and when you're working on startup environments, uh, it's it's really important to assess that your ID is the correct one before going on to uh, designing a. Uh, an electrical board and an electronic board and then an OS and then a system, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, my, my last uh, uh, thought about it is uh, with tools like uh, Visual Studio Code and um, Azure IoT Hub or Azure IoT Central, one of the cool things is uh, you can start uh, prototyping your project uh, with this and using the same system, the same architecture, and the same tooling, uh, you can graduate uh, to a more advanced uh, system. Uh, so for example, by using um, uh, Visual Studio Code extensions like platform.io, I can start my project with um, a classic Arduino board and then move my code, move my project, move my build system uh, to a much more dedicated system like uh, uh, using uh, ST microelectronics or uh, Nordic semiconductors, uh, microcontrollers were much more specialized uh, but what you're doing with uh, with a default Arduino board. Uh, so if you have a small project, yes, you can probably use these boards um, depending on, on the requirements you have. But one of the cool things is what I've showed you, uh, we have this from prototypes to millions of devices deployments. Uh, and that's, that's one of the cool things about it, is that you stay with the same environment and you can graduate your project without having to redo anything uh, when you go from one stage to, to another. Uh, we don't have any other question in the chat. Uh, I also looked at the YouTube stream and there are no questions there. Uh, so I think uh, that's all for now. Is there anybody who wants to ask maybe one final question by unmuting yourself instead of writing it in the chat? Do we have any other question from the attendees? Uh, looks like no. So. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for attending this session. Christoph, thanks a lot for taking time out of your busy schedule and doing this interesting session for us. I don't remember when was the last time we did anything around IoT, probably two years back. So definitely for this user group, this is a different topic and I definitely learned something new. Great. Uh, yeah, looks like Nias has a question. So yeah, uh, go ahead, Nias. I won't interrupt you. Uh, Hello. The last question. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so my question, actually it's not a question, it's something uh, I just wanted to know if you guys would be interested uh, in doing, uh, which would be like, uh, for example, I assume that you have already started working with a lot of startups and stuff like that, especially into the IoT sector. Uh, now, as, as you said also in the initial um, presentation that the value is what drives IoT. It's all about ROI, um, the return of investment that someone gets by adopting IoT into its skill. So do you have or do you intend to have a session where um, people could benefit from your experience working with startups in creating value for um, the clients or for the markets? I, you, you don't know how happy I am you ask this question. And it's not like I'm a French person, I am, I'm not an American, so I'm not saying amazing, etc. all over the place. Um, the reason I, I I did these slides, so I already done this presentation a bunch of time, but it's the first time I'm giving this presentation with these two uh, IoT value slides. And my intention behind it uh, in a truly startup fashion was to test the market to see if people want to learn more about this topic. Uh, so it's a win for me. Uh, thanks for, for asking. Um, yes, I, I'm planning to do um, more content about the value of IoT and how you can um, like assess the value of your um, IoT IDs 
so without even having to to actually do anything or prototype anything, how you can uh, with a Canva or something like that assess uh, the value of your your IoT ID. Uh, so my recommendation would be to follow me on Twitter uh, because I hope uh, by the end of uh, next month uh, to uh, to release a first. I don't know, document, maybe it would be a page on Microsoft Docs, maybe it would be uh, on my blog, but something around uh, around this topic. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Christoph, for taking that question. Uh, people are asking about your Twitter handle. Uh, I can post it. I have it. Okay. I will post it in the chat. So uh, once again, uh, thank you. Thanks for taking time and doing this wonderful session for our user group. Uh, merci beaucoup, if that's the correct way of pronouncing it in French. Is and it? Have a nice day ahead. And for the Thanks guys for in Singapore, me. yeah. Uh, good you. night. Thanks for joining. I hope you will join us in the next week's session.